welcome everyone to this month AMA session at Public Lab. I'm going to kick this off. I have Max as our sixth guest because I was just really impressed after knowing Max, how Max is always helping people to get into no code. And I think he has built a very strong community called the 100 Days of No Code. And personally, I think community building is just another way of audience building. So I would really like to learn more from him. And so far, our guests have been like indie hackers and technical oriented. So this is a very good chance for us to hear something new. And I talked to Max a few times since then, and we have been like sharing knowledge with each other. And I really appreciate how he has put helping people at the center of his audience building. Let's just kick it off. Max, I usually like to just get rid of the community building, audience building and business and just to get to know you. Who are you? A lot of people here might not know you. Who are you? Like, where are you based? What are you working on right now? Yeah, good, good question. And yeah, really, really um, excited to excited to be here yeah so uh, this one this one's an odd one because you say we're so focused on like you know what company is he building like what indie project is he like making money on all this stuff but yeah we never kind of touch on like the yeah the the person behind the, the brand or whatever it is so yeah thank you for asking that so yeah i'm london based if you can't tell from my accent and essentially yeah I'd, i've kind of gone through through school like anyone else and recently graduated from university doing business and politics and went pretty briefly, pretty quickly after that into like a social entrepreneurship program for a year post uni. And then kind of here I am. So like a, a very, very quick backstory. But yeah, when people kind of asked, like, what was I doing before? Like, I wasn't doing much. So yeah, that's kind of a very quick snapshot of me at the, at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so you just graduated from university. I, well, I didn't know that at all. Yeah, re re reasonably recently. So yeah, I'm glad to be out of academia, as I'm sure a lot of us are. <laughs> That's amazing. Like, I, I thought you have been like an entrepreneur for a long time. <laughs> no, no, no way. Yeah, I've uh, definitely fooled a few people there. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I were to ask your you know close friend or best friend how would they usually describe you i think they would generally say that i'm obsessive about sports it's just like the i don't know i i'm, I'm always banging on about sports so forgive me if i like go on off on like some some sporting like analogies and on this conversation but uh, yeah i think i think they'd just say you know hopefully they'd say that i'm a, a, li a likable kind of humble person that's just keen to like get my head down and is far too sarcastic because that is my my humor is sarcasm so yeah again forgive me if i am overly sarcastic on this call today <laughs> i don't feel that from you at all like on twitter from our conversations <laughs> i don't see your sarcasm at all this is the the alter ego it must be so a lot of people like they might know you they might not know you Let, let's dive into the community of no code like i'm really curious how did you start this did you get some signals data points did you do some prototypes how did it all happen yeah there was there was definitely no like a kind of grand vision at all behind me starting a no code community if you told me a year ago that i'd be running a no code community i would like absolutely laugh in your face um because i actually entered the no code space with two intentions one to like learn to no code and that was like my priority and learn this th these skills mainly bubble just get really good at it so i can build all these ideas in my head cool that was a, like number one on the checklist and then number two was actually funny enough building an online community for for runners so that was why I kind of was eager to learn these these tools because I wanted to build like a bespoke kind of custom space for runners to interact, share gear, keep each other motivated, etc. But essentially, before I could really work on that or give it the time it needed, people started telling me that they they liked this this whole concept of 100 days. And that was kind of my first signal that this is something I should double down on and kind of lean into. How has it been going so far? How, how So it has been less than a year, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So essentially, when I started in no code, I kind of looked around the space and thought, okay, there's not really any 
guide or like anything that gives me structure here to kind of pursue this skill. I mean, it was, it was still very early at that time. And yeah, I, I just felt like there was a lack of, of structure in the space. There wasn't someone to like hold my hand, which is kind of why I, I just rinsed and repeated a hundred days of code because this is something I was going to do before learning to know code. And just for actually, that's a really nice formula. It's time bound, it's neat, and it's easy to follow. Let's just rinse this and do this for, for no code. And I needed it at the time, selfishly, like I need this hundred day structure to, to like push me and it was locked down. So we had more time on our hands. So it was perfect timing. And I think that's kind of why it resonated with people when I, I started it, because we had a some more time on our hands people were trying to upskill because they'd lost their jobs and no code was kind of blowing up so those three things combined made it like the perfect uh, kind of perfect storm that's awesome <laughs> so for me like i guess that's why we connect so well because we're kind of on on the same stage in the same phase but you are definitely ahead of me but for me i, I was writing in public about how i started the community i i started with a dm group so just eight people. How did you start? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. So so it, it really it really did start on Twitter. So as a hashtag. So there's a hundred days of no code hashtag. It started like literally the day that I announced with with 50 followers saying, Hey everyone, I'm gonna be spending the next hundred days learning this new skill. Um does anyone want to join me on this this journey? And I'd already kind of made or built some relationships with a couple of people in the no-code space that had kindly shared that tweet. And yeah, that was kind of when people started using the hashtag. And that was when the kind of community or the first seeds of it began. People simply sharing and taking part in this challenge and then interacting with others doing the challenge. And that wasn't even me nurturing that or anything that was a fully organic like movement is far too grandiose but that's kind of like the best word for it it was just like this very decentralized organic thing going on on twitter i had no control of and then my first kind of step into let's formalize this a bit let's actually bring people together in a, like an intentional way was running masterminds running kind of stand-ups because I, what i saw or, or a theme i kind of saw was people we're taking the challenge, we're taking 100 days, got super excited at the start. And then by day 15, they were no, nowhere to be seen. So I kind of thought I'll make a, an intervention here and give them like a, a weekly stand up for them to join. And at this point, there, there was no payment, there was no like paid membership or, or anything like that. It was completely free. And that was so running these like weekly accountability groups was kind of the first time where we had face-to-face -face contact as a, as a community. <laughs> so like for me to think about community building, I, I personally think that is an advanced level up of audience building because audience building is about like growing followers on Twitter, right? You can get like four or 5,000 followers, mm -hmm. but community is uh, usually smaller, but it, it usually very close to you. Like you have to do a bunch more things for them, but they are like next to you. Yeah. That's how I see the difference. Like for you, when you started the community, were you thinking about audience building? I wasn't thinking about either actually, because I didn't know that the, I didn't really actually know anything about those two terms. Like it sounds, it sounds crazy, but yeah, I didn't know or understand what community building was or what audience building was at that point in time. I wasn't that kind of like deep into like the indie hacker space or anything like that. So the, the terms weren't like slung about much. So I was probably doing it in a very like unintentional way without knowing that I was kind of maybe doing some community building. Like, like if you'd have looked at my Twitter bio at that point, I would never have said community builder because I didn't know it existed. But I think, I think that the difference I see in kind of like the best way to look at it is, and it's been explained on Twitter many a times, but just looking at audience as people that know you and then community as people that know you and then each other. And that's kind of like the simplest like distinction I find, but I think if you can start looking at your audience as a community, your audience will get a lot more value. And so if you start treating them like a community, then actually they're going to get a lot more value from you and they're going to get a lot more value from each other. So that's kind of 
basically to say you should be community building even if you're audience build building so that that's kind of the advice there i'd give maybe i don't know if that made sense but i think that's kind of the way i look at it and just recently like a kind of a thing i've been seeing is i've been sharing like questions more on twitter and that has actually brought people together in a much better way than me just giving some like generic rubbish advice like one line so just actually opening it up so people can interact share their thoughts and then kind of communicate with each other it's been far better than my like sort of mundane platitudes on twitter <laughs> yeah that that's a good strategy at first i thought it's just people you know stealing attention from others but now i understand it actually opens up conversations when you pose a question in your tweet i do want to ask like lately i've heard a lot of people wanting to start a community maybe some people in the audience as well but can you can you share like a few sweetness and a few bitterness <laughs> just to give a reality check to everyone out there <laughs> yeah of course yeah i've got a big smile on my face and you do as well kevin because <laughs> you you know how like kind of tough it is it's certainly not for the faint-hearted and i think it it's certainly not for people that want to build a community for the sake of building a community. I think you have to get in, into it for for like the pure intention of wanting to help other people and get them to another outcome or, or space they're not in at that point in time. So for me, I started in no code, selfishly wanting to learn to no code myself, but actually I very quickly turned that from, I want to help other people learn to no code. This is my mission now and I want to to make this like my thing that I do. And uh, so I think making sure you've got that, that, that mentality is, is, is crucial. And if you don't, and, and that's absolutely fine, then, then maybe community building isn't for you. But I think in terms of the highs and the, the, the lows, the sweetness is seeing people engage with other people they would never have met beforehand and getting value from that, that conversation or that exchange of information or whatever. I think that is the sweet, sweet spot or the like the sweetness where it's like, ah, amazing. Like this is, this is what we're doing it for. <laughs> and then, and then the, the, the lows I think are just the kind of the, the, the life cycles and the, the, the rockiness that a community will naturally go through. So for me, I've definitely seen like life cycles in the hundred days community, obviously people come and go, but also people stay more engaged for periods and then less engagement over other periods of time. So the, the waters are always rocky and there's never a consistent spell of engagement. And that is always tough as a community builder, because one day you can check in and there's, you know, it's popping off and you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is it. We've hit the point where everyone is talking and it's really, you know, a useful community. And then other days where it's, there's zilch and it's just quiet and it's like a ghost town. And I'll openly admit that, you know, you have days like that, but then it will, will, will always pick up. So. Hi, Max, and thanks for joining us. Um, super excited about what you're doing. Definitely see your Twitter and kind of all the things that you're mentioning. I'm curious about, you know, as like, you know, you're obviously doing community building. Would you also put yourself in the bucket of like course creator? And how do you balance the amount of like content that you're sharing that's scalable to your full community versus like kind of doing the one-on-ones and helping people or having like members help each other? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And it's not something I do very well at all. So is it is it kind of, you kind of wondering how I like use my time and how much I spend on creating content that essentially lots of people see and then content that only is seen by like my community members or even like on one-on-one -on -one kind of DMs is that kind of yeah the question yeah I'm on I'm curious I guess around your time management versus mm. the value prop that you're marketing to your community members like mm. would you say your main value prop for them is community and like accountability or is it to actually learn no code through you got you or... got you got you yeah yeah that yeah and so i think i think definitely i've led with like a community first approach versus a content first approach so if you see something like makerpad they started very much with a content heavy approach and then kind of unraveled the community whereas i think i'm doing it 
the other way around and there's no right way i don't think it it came on naturally for me to start community because there's just so many resources in no code that are available for free anyway and it's a lot of it comes down to curation rather than creation but yeah my time is is definitely focused on uh, amplifying that community value prop over the content value prop but that is me just being a solo founder and i want to you know nail both of those things because they're i think they're, they're they're both super important but my resourcing is definitely focused on community because i think that's a gap in the, the space and i want to make sure that people's needs are met from a, like an emotional kind of learn a point of view over a, like a, a more technical one where they're like oh how do i plug this into integromat or something so yeah that's that's my thought process at least. okay let's keep the questions going if someone were to grow an audience on twitter like in the early days is there anything from your early experience that you can give it to them as like the the secret sauce of starting off on twitter yeah, you should be answering this, Kevin. You just released uh, a Twitter Twitter guide, didn't you, last week? And actually, Janet, I think it was from your thread this morning, is, is an approach I, I took, was essentially leveraging other people's audiences when you're just getting started. So f for, for me, that was about relationship building rather than audience building or community building. So first, making relationships with people that you really want to connect with in the space. And then from those relationships, you will just naturally get, you know, shares and retweets through their audience. And it's not something you're, you're going, oh, I want to be friends with this person because they've got 5k followers. It's just, I really want to connect with them because they are generally interesting to me. And also I feel like I can add value to them. And then you can essentially play off each other. And for, for me, uh, that person was KP in the no code space. I reached out to him as the first person in the no code space saying, look, I've, I've got this idea. Could you help me? And he was one of the people that shared my initial hundred days of no code challenge tweet, like when I was just getting started and that like gave me access to a, an audience that I would never have had access to before. So relationship building is the first thing you should do on Twitter before even thinking about audience building or community building. That, that's pretty awesome. I just want to ask a quick follow up because I've heard questions like when is the right time to ask people for something in DM? <laughs> this is pretty tough, right? Do you have an answer for that, Max? I I mean, for me, just being like on the receiving end of some DMs, I always just like the tell me what you want and, and, and why I can help you and why I should help you. I think just getting to the point is much better than like, hey, how are you? And then it's like this kind of back and forth that's just really unnecessary. And that may be, sound a little bit cold, but really for me, I, I just, when I'm reaching out to people as well, I like to say exactly what I need, why I need it and, and how they can help and, and what value I can give them in exchange potentially. So definitely just getting to the point is, is better for me personally. Uh, yeah. But if, if that person doesn't know you is, like if you just go in right away, would that person be like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's honest, yeah, I, I, I almost, I prefer that appro approach. Okay. Yeah, as you say, it's it's delicate. People respond in different ways, so that may not be the best approach for for, for Got it. reaching out to everyone. Yeah, so it depends on the receiving end person. I think cool. so. Yeah, and as you say, if you know that person or that person's in similar circles to you, you can probably get away with like pushing that ask right to the front versus maybe waiting a little bit to build that relationship up. Sometimes, in a, when you one interesting thing about communities is sometimes you plan certain things and then the members are creative enough to make things happen. So, do you have any interesting activities or interactions that you didn't expect as you're building it? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that that is the state in which like if, if members are organizing or coming up with ideas for things they want, I think that is like, that's awesome. You, you're kind of reaching a point of like decentralized community where it's kind of going organically. For me, there was an interesting thing in the 100 days community where just as like one small isolated example where there was a bunch of people in in the community that were kind of eager to explore becoming freelancers in no code 
and they essentially gathered together and created like a series of, of, of round tables so they could just meet and discuss the best approaches to becoming like a, a no code freelancer. And that was kind of organic thing that I didn't didn't see as a community manager coming. I didn't facilitate, but people kind of, you know, just rallied around each other. So yeah, that's kind of one. Thank you. So Max, it was super cool to hear your origin story. I never actually heard it before. I love that it, it started from scratching your own itch basically and turned into this project, I guess, that, that took up more time than you expected. And then there comes this point where you're like, okay, this is not a hobby anymore. I'm going to do this full time. And I guess at that point, you need to make a mental switch, which kind of leads to my question because you can't kind of live in reaction anymore. So I'm very curious, what is your vision for uh, 100 days and where do you think or hope it will be in two or three years? Yeah, the million dollar question. That is so true. It's kind of, for me, definitely going out of out of the reaction mode and like, oh my gosh, like, oh, I should actually spend some more time on this to oh, I need to spend more time on this because it's it's now more of a, a thing. You know, I, I'm not sure if I plan that far ahead, but in terms of like the vision for the community, I definitely want it to be, you know, I'd probably say like vision statement wise, like the most accessible place to start learning to no code. Because what I see and what I mean by that is you know, no code itself is a democratizing force, but it still needs education behind it. But I don't necessarily see the education in the space at the moment as particularly accessible, particularly for those beyond the tech bubble that we're currently in. So I kind of, the vision is to make things accessible in free ways. So to make content really beginner friendly, so anyone can like grasp it, even like your mom or your nan. I mean, that's probably a little bit of a stretch, but you, you get what, get what I mean. Also like affordable. So we want, I want to make like the education piece and the membership affordable to lots of people. And that again, does have trade-offs or, or ramifications on the, the type of people you're appealing to. And then lastly, just like inclusion. So again, speaking to people that aren't us essentially aren't like people that are all in the tech bubble, like a, that, that are engrossed in this space already and kind of delivering on what no code should do. And that is sort of give rise to you know, anyone to be a builder, just n not just people in the tech space. So that's kind of like my vision. I don't know whether, whether that really like gives you a, like a picture of what it will look like in three years, but that's hopefully what I'm kind of aiming towards. If you see what I mean. Absolutely. That was perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Let's talk about slightly building in public because public lab is about building in public sure. and we all sort of know that authenticity is a key way to do marketing these days. For you, Max, I, from my memory, I don't think you share like numbers and uh, a lot of the things that you're actively working on, but you do share like your journey quite transparently. I think I recall reading like maybe mistakes or struggles on your Twitter account. So I just want to hear from you, like how do you approach building in public in your own way? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it, it, really good question. It's definitely not something that's come naturally naturally to me. Yeah, I was very much of the, who, who the hell do I think I am to be sharing opinions and sharing like my story and, and my thoughts when I was just getting started. I think I've built confidence over, over time, but I was certainly in the, how dare I, or like, how, how should I have the audacity to, to be sharing like, my opinions online, why will people care? But I think it's actually just being at peace with the fact that people don't care and therefore you have more like a freedom to share your opinions because like the, the risk attached to that is, is lower in a way. I think me where I approach it, I don't share numbers or anything like that. And that's somewhat intentional just because that is, is, is actually part of like my insecurities. I think like uh, sharing numbers, I don't really want to firstly like put some people uh, a little way behind me on my journey, they may kind of get discouraged and maybe it, they may be motivating, but I worry that sometimes, yeah, sharing numbers can, can discourage people, but I don't think that is the case in, in most circumstances. And so that's probably an unfounded like worry, but I, but also think like, I, I think, oh, my numbers aren't big enough as well. So it's like, I don't want to be like this 
yeah just sharing something that i'm not like pleased pleased about and that's kind of where my perfectionism comes in is probably and why i'm not very good at building in public but but in terms of what i do do i do try and kind of share the highs and the lows so that people can relate to that and connect with my journey and say oh okay yeah it's not just this plain sailing thing and i can learn something from the mistakes that max is making over over time so yeah, that's kind of the way I've approached it. Yeah, I, I definitely haven't w worked out the, the art of building in public. I've certainly learned from you, Kevon, definitely the shift in sharing just knowledge instead of like imparting knowledge. And I, I liked your kind of framing of that is something I'm trying to do because sharing your experiences and stuff it isn't so much you're just sharing what you you do and what you you're you're doing versus listen to me like this is something you need to listen to so yeah that's as you can tell the way i'm speaking about it like i don't have a good answer because i'm not very like good at it <laughs> so I'm, I'm learning i learn this learning this right now as myself uh, no i think that's great like to me, a lot of people have misconception about building in public. Like you have to share your daily to do, you have to share your income. I don't think so. I think as long as you share your lessons, I mm. think you are building in public. <laughs> but of course, everyone has different definitions. Hi, Max. Yes, I've seen you a lot on Twitter and it's cool to have you here. So my question, my initial question was, I wanted to ask what would be some advice for people starting out a community? But I thought like a better question would be, what do you think are the worst ways to run the community? Like what should you not do and <laughs> what should you avoid? Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, I, I've got, got quite, quite a few things that I've done, done wrong in, since starting 100 days. So I would actually start with, with like over complicating your tech stack when you get started. So for me, I've kept things pretty lean and the, the community really revolves around our Slack. But one of the first things I did when I started the 100 days Slack is, is create all these channels for all these tools, expecting people would, you know, jump in and, and engage and have all these conversations. But clearly they wouldn't because there wasn't many people at that time and their interests weren't weren't that clear to me or to them about what they should be talking about so i would instead when you start like a slack or a circle is limit the amount of channels for people to speak to a maximum of like two to three just so that you can have that space to start analyzing patterns in what people are speaking about and then only then once you've seen okay people are speaking a lot about building public then create a channel for it so you're slowly unraveling the community into like segments of interest so that's kind of one actually big learning i had when i was getting started is funneling the discussion and the noise so people are engaged in one place and then slowly unraveling that over time so that's just one thing and then what else wouldn't i do again I think I think I'm probably answering it like what you should do, but I I would say just try and be in or like don't try and automate things too quickly. So one of the things that people always tell me is like Max, like what are you doing? Like you're in all these calls, like you're talk like how do you have the time to do this? And in the masterminds, most of them, I'm in like I do the workshops, of course, um, and. Yeah, I'm basically in everything and I do one on one on boarding calls as well. And people are like, what, like, what are you doing? But actually it's given me, especially in this early stage, it's given me a wealth of insight on an understanding about my, about my members and understanding what they need and how I can help them. Um, so maybe in two, three years time, that's not possible, but that wealth of understanding of who I'm serving will be invaluable for me long term so that's all to say don't automate too quickly and don't try and automate yourself out of those conversations because that is exactly where you're going to learn the most about how you can help you. Uh, so that's yeah a couple couple of things thanks max i loved your answer to the last question too by the way max i think that's uh, absolutely right like do things that don't skill in the beginning and build those relationships so my question my second question is what are some ways that you might leverage the community to make content or building in public easier so 
For instance, I know that you do the demo days, which I imagine attracts and inspires other people outside of 100 days. And you usually upload AMA sessions and stuff to YouTube. And I think they are publicly accessible. So mm -hmm. are there other ways that you might use the community or leverage the community to help, I guess, spread the word and, and build the community out? Yeah, good question. That's definitely something I'm thinking about now in terms of building that kind of content engine and, and, and flywheel, but, but a, a couple of things that we started doing that have kind of, kind of increased the, the pipeline of content from within the community and therefore has taken it off me is one opening up community events. So those are member led events where people can share their own knowledge. So essentially tap, tapping into the knowledge of existing members and having them as is almost your like create creators in residence essentially so i'd say that that content has been really useful so i talked about the, the freelancer roundtable discussion but that content i haven't actually used it yet but that's like a gold mine of content for people externally that want to learn about freelancing in the no code space because you've got 10 15 no coders talking about that and their journey on that front which is just you know really useful for for anyone on that journey so i think one some member-led events i think yeah events that are accessible to people to join who aren't in the community so what i do with the weekly workshops is i open it up to people that aren't in the community that gives them kind of a taste of what the community is like who's in it and then some of the content that we do and that is a good way to acquire new members but then as you say create that content stream that I can share on YouTube. Um, just thinking if there's any other ways. And then hashtag is always quite useful. So you've got, I've got kind of people sharing their hundred day journey every day. And that is content that's user generated content. I mean, some of it's pretty like done this, done this, done this. Others it's like, here's like a cool tip that I've learned, which is more content, but that in itself is like a content engine, which is, which is cool. So yeah, maybe a hashtag is always good to kind of throw, throw in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the answer. And I think you are one of the few people who has, you know, successfully owned a hashtag that people actually use. I think it's, I don't know if it, if it is by design, but it's, uh, it's definitely, I think a huge, uh, yeah, a huge amount of exposure for uh, for the community. How do you balance building public tweets versus marketing tweets for 100 days of no code? For building public tweets, I mean, I think she means the the tweets where you share your lessons. I kind of see them as one and the same thing, just because I don't like, again, intentionally, I don't really share much from my 100 days of no code account, my official account. I don't like post any original content from there. It's all through me. So I think anything that's coming from me is just building my personal brand and my personal brand is very connected or heavily connected to hundred days of no code. So whatever I'm sharing is essentially marketing promotion for hundred days, whether that is people wanting to just connect with me or whether that's people that are just intrigued by the topics I'm talking about, which generally are no code or community building related means that I'm kind of marketing in a, a subtle, subtle way, regardless of whether I'm doing it in public or for marketing kind of purposes. Thank you, Max. Hi, Max. So I wanted to ask, like, what do you think, like, the, will building a community around our product, will it help? to increase some sales? I've not really done kind of like a community building around a, a particular product, but I think I think the, the kind of the age old advice is, is just understanding. So why would you be building a community around that product? Is there like a tangible reason for you to do that? Is there something that you can give your customers or your potential users that they don't already have with that community that you're thinking of running? So I think the first thing I would ask yourself is how will a community add value to people around your product if it doesn't or if it's just like something that you're kind of thinking of because it's community building and that's kind of the in thing I, I would yeah maybe just 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 have a think on that but generally yes yeah it will add value to your your product because people will be sharing insights on how to use it and you'll be getting a lot of user generated content and it will also you know act hopefully as a as a good you know marketing 
mechanism externally as well but but i don't know the product so i'm not sure but those are the things i'd consider like how would you compare a public community versus a private community like suppose in the hacker it's a public community like anyone can join over there but like mm. if suppose we will consider public lab like it's a private community mm. so like how would you compare both of these communities yeah i think i think just the the it's a good question the the added friction point can often like get more engagement from members and that exclusivity is is something that yeah just garners more skin in the game or or cuz there's skin in the game you've got more engagement and there's more excitement and kind of uh appeal i, I think also they're they're generally smaller versus obviously open ended ones which are a larger and more organic and kind of less like leadership led and more kind of just bottom up so it's kind of just anyone's game but yeah generally the foot, like product communities are free are open ended so but i i've never seen like an exclusive product community but yeah i don't know i'm not sure on that one yes sure thank you thank you max all right thank you max for your time i have one last question for you I saw on Twitter yesterday that you're launching like a six-week cohort-based course. Can you tell us a bit more to wrap this up? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I wince because yeah, it's one of those things that I'm slightly not anxious about, but it's just it's just a new thing. So it's like, oh my gosh, how is this going to go? But essentially, it's a, a six-week cohort-based course on on how you can get started in no code in the quickest possible way, and that is very much going to be project-led. Um, and peer to peer over a 6 week period where you'll be kind of working on live or like real world projects intimately with with other people in the cohort the thinking behind it is that again this is just from my insights from speaking with my community is that some people need that really like intense like push and momentum and some people just need a community to chill out at and like and kind of pop in every month or or so So I'm kind of responding to the needs of the community and saying for those that need that kind of shove this is for you and you need that in more intense environment this is for you and then the community is always going to be there for 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 those that don't need it. So that's kind of why it's why it's come about and um really excited to see what happens with it. Thank you Max. Thank you so much. Uh good to have you here. Just one last thing before we go. Uh group photo. <laughs> so I thought sure. we can do something new today. Maybe we can high five the the person next to us. Oh, no, that's good. That's really good. <laughs> Cutting edge it, community building, right? I think here. we might have to like do right. both sides because it's randomized, right? Mm, yeah. All right. Is everyone ready? Three, two, one, go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I got it. Thank you so much, Max. <laughs> Appreciate yeah. your time. Of course, yeah, been been super fun. Thanks everyone for your questions and yeah, answering them is always good to kind of it's always thought provoking. So yeah, especially that Yama one on the vision three years now. I, I need to create a three, a three year plan. So thank you for that. Awesome. All right, everyone, have a good Thursday, Friday, and weekend. See you later. Thank you, Max. <laughs>